Hey, look at that. We're back. It's been a we it's been back. long, a long, long break. Uh, but no. we haven't given up on this project. And uh as a this is season four, episode eleven. Uh, and to get us back in the groove, hmm. uh, we have asked one of uh, uh one of our most prominent educators in the country, Mike Schmoker, uh, to come and join us. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. Good morning, Mike. Thank you Good morning, for coming Penny. to join Tell us. Me. It's really an honor. I have read, I read results now. I remember bringing it to a faculty meeting and a department chair meeting and saying, you guys, we got to look at this. And now we have, do you have it with you, Kelly? I do, but I want to back up just a second and said my first introduction to Mike is I actually read Focus. Same first, here. Yep. Which is now a second edition. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I read Results Now, uh, which you and I have cite, uh, cited, I think, focus here and there and some of Mike's writing and educational leadership. But now we have Results Now 2.0. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe it, Mike, when I took a peek at it, that that the original had come out in 2006. And so here we are 2.0. So I guess my first question is, why 2.0? What, what's changed? Well, when I wrote the first one back when, um, I, I was really struck by the fact that there were certain things that would really make a difference in teaching and learning. Uh, the, the thing I centered on at the time was some of the same things I do now, but learned mostly and fundamentally through, say, professional learning communities. I have to say my, uh, my center of gravity has shifted. I believe in uh, professional learning communities and teachers learning from each other as much as ever. However, I really think there are certain fundamental things that have to go on in classrooms, which don't. Mm -hmm. And more than anything, uh, more than ever, I would say, I'm more convinced now that we could be about to enter really the greatest age in education, mm -hmm. at least in the modern era, let's say. Uh, and, and I say this for, for a reason. I, I actually wanted to make the subtitle of 2.0. I wanted to make it re results now 2.0 toward a golden age of education. Mm. Mm. Just about stealing mm. a phrase from the Fordham Institute, if you guys know Michael Petrelli by any Absolutely. chance. Absolutely. Who's written a monograph with, with that very title. I was going to use parts of it as a subtitle because when you when you look closely at what goes on in schools, the gulf between the best, hugely powerful practices and what actually goes on in schools. It's its a gap, it's, a, it's the size of the Grand Canyon. If we even narrowed that, much less eliminated that gap, the impact on real students, on teachers, on teacher morale uh, would be stupendous. Yeah. Wow. When I when I read results 2.0, I, I was struck by how some of your work resonates with some of the things that Penny and I have been saying. And for example, one of them is you really, really stress the volume issue, uh, both reading and writing. Could you say a little about that? Mm. Uh, sure. Uh, when, when I, uh, I mean, you can you can read all the research there is on this and you're going to discover that very little reading, writing, and meaningful discussion goes on in, obviously, it should it should occur in English classes, social studies, science, and beyond. It really should be a part of just about every curriculum, I think. Um, but it is one, there's just a, a, a manifest, you know, sort of paucity of those three things. That one thing, that one feature of public schooling holds out enormous hope for us. If we went from a school system which undervalues and doesn't allow very much time for reading, meaningful discussion, and writing, and went to one where we even, even doubled, which still wouldn't be all that much, even doubled and maybe tripled the amount of those three things that went on, that by itself would give us a school system, I, I really believe, that would be uh, certainly the envy of of uh, of any previous generation of of uh, of school people. It, it's um, interesting. For, I, I, it's interesting to discover too, as I did many years ago when I'm talking to audiences of educators. I come right out and ask them. I say, "What are the two or three things you're least apt to catch the kids actually doing during English or say social studies?" 
and they pause for a moment. It doesn't take them too long. And then they all bark out reading and writing. And I say, now, how many of you would agree? The hands fly up. Mm -hmm. and again, this goes back to Oh, it goes back to a sort of a, what Michael Fullan calls the, the awful inertia of decades of malpractice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What intruded into the school day and even and especially into, say, English language arts, but not just English language arts, um, was this set of activities, centers, worksheets, little, little tasks and activities, which over time, the accretion of all of those in total just pushed reading and writing and discussion right off the stage. And that's where we are today. But the opportunity that holds out for us is tremendous. I love that you frame it like that because, you know, like Kelly said, we talk a lot about how much writing and how important it is that students have a volume of writing because, you know, Langer and Appleby did that study years ago that said most kids will maybe write a paragraph or they'll write two paragraphs. And I was thinking about test prep culture, which you brought into this book about how, you know, those standardized essays and things that we create for a test, that's never going to meet the volume of writing kids need to do. And my daughter, when she went to Providence College as a freshman, had four 10 page papers her first semester. She was number four in her class. She did very well. She had never written a 10 page paper in the high school. And so I started a course where kids wrote a 20 page study of a subject over one semester and did a TED talk to deliver their big ideas at the end of it. And many of those kids told me the best course they took to prepare them for mm. the volume of writing in college. And now that I'm in the freshman composition program at a university, I can tell you the kids are shocked at the volume of writing. Mm. They just well, don't practice. You know, it's, it's terrific. Two or three things you said so resonate with me. My own daughters had experience just like yours. One of them was second in her class. The one thing she rarely did and was never really taught to do, except by me, was writing. So we really had to hustle to, to ensure that she got those things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of people, educators themselves, they aren't taught. I mean, think about it. how many how many prospective educators are urged by their professors and told, look, you have to have students write, not just so that they can write when they get to college. That's hugely important, of course, but because writing develops, it enlarges, it cultivates the intellect, the ability to think, to, to uh, you know, to uh, synthesize information, process it, put it into, to, to make it your own, all that fabulous stuff that can only happen through writing, and it does it. I taught at the, what most people regard as the Harvard of the Southwest, uh, Arizona State University, well, I'll pa I'll pause for laughs there. Um, uh, I taught it basically a garden garden variety state university. I actually think it's a little better in some ways than it than it was when I taught there. But uh, those kids had even my kids who like the students you mentioned, Penny, who who came to who who graduated very high in their graduating classes, they could not write. They had not been taught to write. Teachers aren't taught to teach writing. It's, it's, on the one hand, it's appalling. On the other hand, my goodness, it, imagine the opportunity it creates. You know, in a way, this is a harsh thing to say. A lot of that book is harsh. There's nowhere to go but up with regard to curriculum, literacy practices, and instruction. The minute we start to narrow the gap between what we, what everyone, I, I almost want to say virtually everyone agrees, is vital. And what we actually do, we're going to see almost immediate gains. I hope to talk about that in a moment. Most of the schools that I talk about, write about, and know about, the moment they went from business as usual to the best stuff we know, the, the impact was within days and weeks, and within one, at the most, two school years, their achievement shot up dramatic you know your your list of benefits of writing are really rich really good i would add to that list that also writing is a vehicle in which you discover your thinking and i know oh, you're man. i know you believe that as well could you talk mm -hmm. about like it's not just writing it's the balance of informal and formal of of, of low pressure ungraded versus 
like Penny, I, I remember the writing project uh, had a study years ago where they said 40% of high school students graduate without ever having written a three page paper. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So what would you say about the balance of the kinds of writings kids should be doing? Oh, I've got to get that down. You, you said that 40% of students have never written a three-page paper. Longer than a three-page paper. Nothing longer than a three-page paper. Yeah. Well, that's a that's an interesting statistic too. Yeah. And forgive me, what did you say? Did, is your question, what do I see as the balance among different kinds of writing? Well, yeah. Well, yeah. And and okay, more writing. What does that look like? Um, for for me, as often as possible, almost daily, if students are reading short story, poem thinking of English just for the moment, uh, say, say, say fiction, they should be analyzing characters, discussing them, and every day or two, they ought to be writing, oh, a paragraph or two or three, something like that. Now, this is pretty informal stuff most of the time, but it can prepare for, uh, say, for more formal writing at, at some point. And the, and the teacher doesn't have to take this stuff home and grade all of it. They want to be walking around and just making sure that the students are engaging meaningfully with the content and and uh, including the benefits of the discussion that they've had. You know, just shifting ground just somewhat, I almost think a good English class, for instance, ought to consist 80% of the time of basically that formula of you read analytically and closely. You discuss it. You can even be writing while you're reading, by the way. You can intersperse reading and segments of reading mm. with writing. Reading and writing and, and discussion followed by writing and then more reading and discussion and writing. Something like that formula where they occupy, oh, you know, 20, 25 percent of any English or social studies class that really ought to be the basic formula. That is such a far cry, of course, from what goes on in schools these days. Can I can I add one thing to your list there that Kelly and I believe in so strongly is that when those kids are writing, we are writing as well under a doc camera. And the purpose mm. of it is to model for the kids, how do we write about this? And mm. then as we reread our writing, we ask kids to do this daily in class. You reread your writing, listening to it, trying to make it better writing. And we show mm. them, how do we make those decisions? Like, do you see this sentence? This sentence is way too long. This is what I'm trying to say. And if I break it here, can you hear the difference? Mm. And we model that because we find that our students need, uh, many of our students need somebody to show them how to write. You know, my one of my mm. mentors was Donald Murray at University of New Hampshire. And he was always about sure. teach them the process of making decisions as a writer, because it isn't about the product as much as it is teaching them how mm -hmm. to decide what's important, what's not important. Now that I've found this thread of my thinking, I don't need this other stuff. But too many of our kids are writing rough draft, only one draft, right. and turning that in for some kind of grading, or they're looking at a rubric and checking things off instead of really thinking about what is a reader seeing in this piece. And I think that that... I know because I've sat in Kelly's room and watched him model with his students. How many of the students were like, oh, right now you I get have to do what that. it oh, is. Oh, Penny, I couldn't, Penny, I could not agree more. And, and for me, when I talk about writing, I, 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 I really am including that. You have to teach students explicitly how to write, outline. You have to work, just like you say, on a document camera with sentences and compare once have students help you revise sentences, revise paragraphs, revise vocabulary to make it richer. All that stuff has to be. My friend and neighbor happens to be a, a man named Steve Graham. Do you happen to know that name? Gosh, yes. Uh, well, he's, yeah. a, he's a giant in, in this stuff. Yes. And he and I've had this conversation. And, you, you know, it's funny because he he has gotten, or he and his wife have gotten pushback over the notion of teaching kids how to write basically in the fashion that you just described, Penny, in which, of course, Kelly is well known for doing as well. Um, yeah, kids really need to be taught how to write. I wish I had been taught earlier in the game, and I wish my kids had been taught uh, by their teachers. Yeah, I mean, we often say there's a difference between assigning writing and teaching writing, right? And that modeling yeah. is, is really a key piece there. Uh, one of the things, though, that you you 
decry a little bit in, in the book is this how testing culture uh, and and always always drilling kids towards that standardized test is not in the best interest of developing deeper thinkers, readers, writers, speakers. Yeah, it's 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 an it's an awful substitute for an actual education. It's it's just so it's so troubling. Um, I, I, but I hear again, a lot. You know, of I teachers, can remember a lot of teachers killing. say a lot of teachers say, uh, but I have to teach the test. You know, this is what I'm what I'm being uh, evaluated on. What's oh, your response and, and, to that? And to your to that to that very point, I think Kelly, you know, Richard Elmore, I I, I dedicated. 2.0 to Richard Elmore. And he talks about this thing called the buffer. And the buffer is this sort of barrier that makes that makes it hard for us to see what goes on in school mm. and what ought to go on in school. I mean, we're on the outside and, and he's talking as much as anything about the public, parents, the community. They don't know what goes on in schools. If they knew, he strongly suspects, and, and do many others, so do many others. That if we really saw what went on, we'd be pretty disturbed by what really goes on in garden variety classrooms. Now, but the buffer goes a little further than that. To your point, even teachers themselves, and I've worked with them, Tim Shanahan, you know him. He's worked with in schools where the where the principal says, Oh, well, you know, you really need to be teaching these kids how to basically do well with regard to those skills that are on standardized tests. They don't know. There's a buffer between. The average educator, mm -hmm. there's a buffer between them and that knowledge base that, that says and proves that lots of reading and writing and engagement with text is really what raises test scores and prepares students for what everything we hold dear. Mm -hmm. They don't see that. Uh, one of the biggest problems in education is that very few administrators or teachers see beyond that buffer see clearly that what's going on in their schools represents I'm, I'm going to have to quote Michael Fullen again that, that it represents this the awful inertia of decades of a sort of accretion of malpractice and I could talk at length about that but what go ahead Kelly I didn't mean to interrupt no no not at all I mean uh I, I really like what you're saying about volume I, I know in one of the educational leadership articles uh, that you wrote that you you suggest mm. that kids should be reading at least an hour a day across content areas in a mm. school day. They should be writing at least forty minutes uh, a day across. It's, and and that, Steve Graham says there, and I think I'm with Steve. Steve says it should be more like an hour of writing. Yeah, it ought to be an hour and an hour. And those are especially with reading. I think that's a bare minimum. You've and that would a five be a or six hour school day a game changing impact, I think is the expression that yes. you use. And, and so I love that. And I love the volume and idea of reading and writing, but the other element we haven't talked about really is talk. Mm. Uh, and specifically you're a proponent of Socratic seminar. Uh, mm. Maybe you could say a little bit about the value of that. Well, sure. And for what it's worth, I just wrote an article for the summer issue of uh, the American educator about the importance of discussion. One of, the, one of the things we all need to realize, and again, we don't see this clearly enough. There's almost every research study shows very little, if any, meaningful, you don't even, you don't have to call it Socratic. Some of us kind of like that because it, it means it's a meaty, analytic, meaningful discussion that arrests kids, you know, energy and enthusiasm. Um, but there is so little of that. Kids can go years without mm -hmm. a mean, a single meaningful discussion. When in fact, I mean, there are people who say that maybe that is the fundamental uh, uh, literacy skill um, because it does of course feed into and furnish us with what we need to write well. I mean, they're all reciprocal. They all feed into each other. We know this, but meaningful, large amounts of meaningful discussion about large amounts of reading and writing I, are, is really the name the name of the game. And I worry too, you know, to if if I may say too, um, students arrive, and I've read many articles from college professors who say students arrive at college these days with nothing more than strong opinions 
that they've just absorbed from the culture. It's not from reading both sides of an issue. It's not from processing it through analytic reading and real discussion and listening to each other's divergent thoughts. They get right up through senior year and graduation and they hit college because they've never done that stuff before. They have no respect, no appreciation for the fact that every idea has a counter idea. Every point has a counterpoint. They, they don't realize the magic of listening hard to each other and learning from each other and kind of reaching, oh, we'll call it synthesis or compromise um, or, or, or wisdom through discussion. And that article in the American Educator is actually called, uh, what do I call it? The urgent need for free, oh, wouldn't you know, I'd forget the article, for free frequent classroom discussion. We really need to make that the third leg of the tripod of literacy. I think you'd appreciate, I was um, visiting East Side Community High School in New York that has just incredible principal, Kelly and I have been interviewed him twice and it's a regular public school. But the year that I was there, they were doing um, an initiative that went from sixth grade all the way through 12th grade called Accountable Talk. And it was really about mm -hmm. how do you contribute to discussions in class? And it would start with small groups and get larger. But what I loved about it was that when I was in a sixth grade classroom and could see how it was being used in sixth grade and then walked into a 12th grade where kids were absolutely talking about a run of four articles they'd all read mm. they were prepared they were ready to argue and just as a staff gathering around one important thing because i think teachers feel like there are usually six or eight things that are new initiatives that have to do and you should be doing this and this and and many that are now coming to teaching without as many um university courses, there's fast tracks to education now, right? Lots of certification happening. That means that teachers will come in and not know the grounding of some of these things. Like they wouldn't oh, and, know. And, that, and that's what's, you know, and that that's something that, that, that we have to mention. Our, yeah. our, people are coming, a couple of things here, Penny, that you mentioned. Um, our teachers aren't getting anything like a grounding in what's most important to be done in the classroom. They're just, they're just not. Mm -hmm. Every study, and this is college professors themselves, some of the most esteemed professors, Robert Pianta, um, Arthur Levine, Seidenberg, all these different people who are saying they're looking around and they can see an institution that, that, that is really hollow. It does not prepare people to teach. That is both Again, a problem, but a massive opportunity. Imagine if our colleges of education, along with our PD, which has been called, you know, lousy, or it's Robert Pondicio writes, it almost always sucks. And this is according to Elizabeth Green, according to teachers. You know, you don't have to go very far to find out that this stuff doesn't prepare people to be uh, effective, effective instructors. Um, we we need to focus, if you will on those few things that make the big difference at our colleges of ed, our PD just does not focus on those things. And, and they don't realize, you talked about a school, is it, was it New York, Penny? Mm -hmm. Yep. School in New York where, where discussion really was really embraced. Imagine the benefits, those, one year of that kind of education could make a huge difference. Imagine if that was 12 for 12 years. I, I, I love to talk about one or two year improvements in schools. There's a, there's a school in New York, Staten Island, maybe you've heard of it, um, New Dorp, where they were, if, if, if I've got the story right, they're gonna close it down because their achievement is so low. In comes someone who basically uh, teaches them how to have meaningful discussions and then, and then folds that into writing, those two things. And they did it with a vengeance and that they focused on that in every class. In two years, they went from being a school marked for closure to having made such sizable gains, they became a, like an educational mecca. I, I the 2.0 is full of such stories. Jesse, Jesse Sanchez, I called him on the phone after I read this article about his, his uh, high poverty school in Brawley, California. He says, I'm looking at kids writing and it's awful. And I'm thinking, well, we gotta do something. Now this is kind of draconian, but he says, all right, every teacher, You've got to have your students write at least two, maybe three times a week, at least a paragraph or two about the content that they're learning. At the end of one year, his, his 
Achievement scores. Again, going back to Kelly's point, test prep has a very limited effect on scores. That one year of reading and writing about what you read, writing about content, they they went from select, something like 35% to 67% of their kids passing their English language arts exam, double the number of kids doing well in math. Uh, countless examples I can think of. Uh, La Cima Middle School in Tucson, Arizona. And this incorporates both curriculum and instruction. They're halfway through the fall semester, this team of teachers who teach English and social studies. They say, hey, why don't we build our curriculum, a common curriculum, same sequence, same content, same, they built it around just this, texts, discussion, and writing with plenty of writing instruction, very explicit instruction in all of this. That's all they did. They read, they discussed, they wrote, and they learned to write. One year they went from, not even that, three quarters of a school year, they went from being in the middle of the pack in a school with about 50, 60% free and reduced lunch to being in a dead heat with the most affluent schools in the state of Arizona. One year. Tom Kane, who's a Harvard professor, says, we don't even come close to doing those things that would have the biggest impact. If we did, it would take us about two years, two years to be right on the heels of the highest achieving school systems in the world. That's how close we are to something like a golden age. In one of your articles, you said, really, if we only had five standards and we really focused on those five standards, like informal writing, formal writing, lots of reading, lots of, lots of talk, you know, if, but, you know, we, we have all these things that we feel like we have to cover and, and mm -hmm. nothing of, of real deep value often happens in classrooms where coverage is the goal. Right. I, read, Kelly, I, I wanted read, to, it's funny, sorry. you know, Kelly, I have to jump in and forgive me, Penny, but coverage really is the goal in some places in a weird way. We cover coverage is, is, is a weird one. P teachers go in because they're conscientious people wanting to cover everything. In the end, they abandon it for what? And the, oh, and the research on this is so rich. We don't we don't end up covering much of anything. We just kind of give up. As Marzano said this years ago. He said, if you realize by October that you're never going to cover all that stuff as much as you want to, you end up, end up just kind of defaulting to what goes on in most classrooms. And I love to kind of tease this out of my audiences. What goes on in most classrooms? According to Richard Elmore in the early 2000s, uh, Lisa Delpit, maybe you know her. Yeah, absolutely. And then I'm Michael Sonnenberg, been through thousands of classrooms, just like me. And they all see what you don't see is teaching. You don't even see coverage. What do you see? You see worksheets and group work, often in combination, and kids sitting in front of screens with no one teaching them. That occupies... It. Angela Peary, Jennifer Gonzalez, you know these names, educators know these names. This is the stuff that stands between us and the kind of education kids need. And we don't realize how simple it would be just to stop, pause, determine what matters most, and then just do our human imperfect best to get those in place and, uh, and implemented in our schools. The, 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 the difference would be swift and dramatic. I'm absolutely convinced. You know, I I wanted to give a shout out to Kelly, that project you did, I was there one time, um, with having every content area do a, contribute to a portfolio of writing. And mm -hmm. I remember that it was the writing journey. Do you remember this long thing that you were involved in? And I think it'd be a great place to to give an example from one, you know, school district, Anaheim, where you were working to try to make that an everyday thing for kids. Well, that all came out of an incident where I was overheard two students mm -hmm. talking who both had a ninth grade science class um, and they had different teachers, although it was the same course. And one kid was complaining about how much writing they had to do. And the other mm -hmm. kid said, we never write in our classroom. And it just struck me that writing should not rely on a quirk on the master schedule of who's teaching the class. And so we embarked on a five, six year project in Anaheim that culminated with uh, at one time pre pre COVID, you could go on any school's website, you could go to any teacher, you could go to any course that the teacher is teaching, and you could see the writing expectations mm. in that mm. class. 
And our UC, University of California admissions rate jumped huge wow. from yes. that. Of course. Uh, yeah. So that I think, you know, was, was uh, again, uh, you know, whenever I, when I, even when I was a young teacher, if I got to a, oh, what am I, I'm between units, what should I do on Friday? I, yeah. My first question is, what are we going to read? What are we going to write? Right. You know, right. I, you know, it, it, I don't know. It just, it's, I was there too, Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. I look back at my early, if, if, if you'll forgive me, I look back at those the early experiences as a teacher. And I just remember coming out of ed school. No one told me that you, you're never out of anything to do. There's always something to read and talk about and write about. And it's never boring as long as we need to stress this, as long as it's not read and then answer, you know, like quiz type questions. Right. Ask meaningful questions that, right. that the kids carry with them while they're reading. And that should be, you know, the substance of English language arts, quite a bit of science. And and even in music and art, shouldn't we be learning about uh, musical epics, uh, art, artistic, um, artistic movements, great musicians, great artists, reading about their biographies, comparing and contrasting them, evaluating them, being inspired by them, talking, and even writing a little bit of, about them. But, but curriculum, to go back to your point, the minute you build clear specs into a curriculum, say for every course, like you did in Anaheim, that's the beauty of curriculum. Without that, you wind up with one teacher teaches quite a bit of writing or reading or, or content. The other just doesn't. And here's the kicker. This is what, what I mean by what, but what Elmore means by the buffer. When I take superintendents, assistant superintendents, principals, teachers through classrooms, they don't really know that there's these vast inconsistencies, bizarre inconsistencies, and inferior materials being used until I go through three or four classrooms with them and warn them ahead of time, by the way, that they're probably not going to see things that would stand the test. Of, does, does, does what you're seeing look like it comes from a real decent curriculum? And they realize probably not. Are we seeing mostly worksheets and kind of aimless extended group work? And they see that by the third or fourth classroom, all this stuff becomes apparent. And I don't say this to be negative. I say it to say, the moment we open our eyes to this, we're going to have experiences. I, you, you know, Abraham Flexner, if you ever heard that name, mm -hmm. in about 1910, this guy saved more lives than anyone in, in human history. People don't know this. He was, he was sent out to visit medical schools and hospitals over a two-year period. He came back and he said, there's a gulf miles wide between what we know about medicine and what actually gets implemented or taught or taught in our med schools. The moment that came to people's attention and they were absorbed the shock, education needs to absorb the shock. The minute they absorbed, after they absorbed the shock, they said, well, okay, what are we gonna do? They focused on the stuff that worked. They began to implement it both in training and in, and in, and in hospitals and it transformed education overnight. Transform Story medicine. not enough people know. Transform medicine, you mean? Transform, forgive me, yes, medicine. Yeah, yeah. Well, that yeah, that's and that's in, that's that anecdote's in one of your books because I've read that. It is. It's in. It's in a couple of them. Yeah. Well, <laughs> as we began today, I, I I volunteered to be the unofficial timer, and we're yeah. already over our usual thirty minutes. But we can't let you go. Uh, it's been a great and rich conversation. We can't let you go though Thank without. You the question we often ask people we interview, what are you reading or what have you been reading of late? Well, you know, I, I, when, when I, when I was kind of preparing for that question, I found myself, here's this book by David Steiner called a nation at thought. And he's seen some improved schools and, and he's heartened by that. And at the same time, he says, you know, we, we don't, the, the thing he stresses is that even in schools where improvement has occurred and we're excited for that improvement there isn't enough of the sort of the, the humanistic, democratic aspect of a good education. I mean, kids, we can we can do better than cute little opportunities for kids to read and write and, and talk. We, we, we need to, to kick it up a bit and really have meaningful, meaningful discussions about literature, human nature, um, 
issues that have an impact on our lives, our civic life, that will that 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 will make our world a better place. Mm -hmm. There's have, one book anyway that I happen to be yeah, re, to be reading right now. Great. great. You have. Uh, I knew this would be a great conversation, and it was. Uh, we're both both Thank of us you. fans for years, and if you want to go richer or deeper uh, with what we've talked about today, Mike's new book is fairly new too. It just came out not too long ago. Came out in May, a number one Amazon bestseller on and off. There you go. <laughs> Results now. 2.0. Hey, Mike, thanks so much for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank you My very much. My pleasure. Thank you both. A real pleasure. A yep. delight. All righty. And everybody else, we'll see you next time. Absolutely. Bye. -bye. Bye.